other scripture this morning. If, for what I'm going to read is from Acts 11, verses 25 and 26. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for, for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass <coughs> that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Our second, excuse me, our second scripture this morning is Luke, verses 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him. After he entered the Pharisee's home, he took his place at the table. Meanwhile, a woman from the city, a sinner, discovered that Jesus was dining in the Pharisee's house. So she brought perfumed oil and a vase of alabaster, standing behind him at his feet and crying. She began to wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured oil on them. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw what was happening, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this was that was touching him. He would know that she is a sinner. Jesus replied, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, speak, he said. A certain lender had two debtors. One owed enough money to pay 500 people for a day's work. The other owed enough money for 50. When they couldn't pay, the lender forgave the debts of both. Which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the largest debt canceled. Jesus said, you have judged correctly. Jesus turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? When I entered your home, you didn't give me water for my feet but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she has poured perfume on my feet. This is why I tell you that her many sins have been forgiven so that she has shown, so she has shown great love. The one who is forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other table guests began to say among themselves, who is this person that even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, how many of you are glad that the election is over? All those TV ads. I don't think one person had one good thing to say about, about their opponent. It, just, it got to the point that it was just, it was too much. I am so thankful that they are over. Okay, do you remember the little playground ditty, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names or labels will never hurt me? Well, sometimes labels are more damaging than broken bones. Those labels stick with us for a lifetime if we don't learn to ignore them. Today we're going to talk about labels. So what's in a label? Well, labels give us important information. Food labels on packages telling us the serving size, the calorie count, and the ingredients. Labels on medication bottles tell us uh, what kind of medication it is, the name of the medication, how many pills are in the bottle, how to take the medication, and how many refills are left. Well, over the years, the Michigan lawsuit Abuse Watch has sponsored an annual contest of the most observed warning labels. Some of the top winners have been do not use this snowblower on the roof. Do not allow children to play in the dishwasher. A warning label on an iron advised, do, do not iron the clothes while they are being worn. On a cardboard sunshield for the car, do not drive with the sunshield in place. There's one on a portable stroller that says, caution, remove infant before storing. In the microwave oven manual, it says, do not use for drying pets. Okay, well, now, why would they make these labels? You think, you think that, you know, people ought to know this. Doesn't it seem obvious enough that, you know, you shouldn't use these products in these ways? But you just know that somebody had to have tried doing these things so that they made the labels to warn against it. 
Warning labels often warn about the obvious. So, have you ever seen a sign that says wet paint? When someone sees that sign, what can you count on them doing? That's right. They're going to touch that wall to see if that paint is still wet. So labels last a lifetime and beyond. To prove this, I'm going to have a little contest with you, and I want your participation. I'm going to begin a name that I want you to finish it. Attila the Hun. Conan the Buffy the Correct. Winnie the Popeye the and Rahab the harlot prostitute. Yep. You know, some people in the Bible have uh, labels. Some are good and some of them are not so good. Adam, he was the father of the human race. Noah, he was a shipbuilder, but he was also a drunk. Moses was a stutterer and a murderer. Jacob was a trickster. Gideon was a warrior. David was king, adulterer, murderer, poet, musician. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. Daniel was a man of prayer. Matthew was a disciple and a, and a tax collector. Peter was a fisherman and a disciple. Thomas was courageous, a doubter, but he also planted a church in India. Saul, or Paul, was a Pharisee. He was a tent maker, but he was a persecutor and then became a missionary. Judas was a disciple, but he betrayed Jesus. So, what are some of the labels that we use to name ourselves? Smart, dumb, thin, fat, lazy, hard worker, angry, frustrated, happy, sad, secure. Labels imprison us. They imprison us in categories that are hard to escape. These labels tend to stick to us and they build up layer upon layer upon layer and are, are hard to remove. Thus, we become encased in our labels. So, so what are some of the labels that we use to call others? Lazy, smart, dumb, dirty, liar, beautiful, ugly, too thin, too fat, athletic, too old, too young. How do you define yourself? By your vocation, teacher, nurse, doctor, dentist, housewife, pastor, lawyer? Or do you define yourself by your accomplishments? I built my own house. I'm in the Hall of Fame. I hold a world record. So what happens once we get caught up in the, the uh, label game? We allow the labels to define us. And when we allow the world to define us, it leads us to become thirsty in our souls because we may not like how we have been labeled. Maybe we cannot live up to the labels that we have been given. In life, we can get stuck and allowing the world to define who we are through labels. One of the most difficult things we need to do in life is to ignore what the world has to say about us and instead listen to what God says about us. God tells us who we are. We are defined by grace. God says that we are chosen, loved, pure, free, worthy, victorious, purposed and valuable. Those are just a few of the words that our Heavenly Father speaks over us. A label may denote several things, ownership, contents, handling instructions, point of origin, destination, etc. The term Christian is a label that we should cherish. It means an adherent to Christianity to give support, to maintain loyalty. It also means little Christ, which at that time was a very derogatory term. When worn truthfully, Christian tells the world a great deal about us. Many package labels uh, bear the markings fragile, handle with care, but this should never be associated with the label of Christian, which we wear. The Christian is instructed by the Apostle Paul to suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, which is from 2 Timothy 2.3. So let's recount our story from Luke. Jesus goes to have a dinner with a Pharisee, and an uninvited guest shows up. The uninvited guest, a harlot or prostitute, stands behind Jesus and gets his feet wet with her tears, 
However, we don't know why she is crying. Then probably embarrassed when she got his feet wet, she dries them with her hair because she has no towel. Now that she is near him, she opens her jar of perfume and she puts it on his feet. We don't know how Jesus felt, but he saw through her and didn't react to her like you and I might have. Simon is different. He begins to criticize this scene in his mind, probably turning red in the face with anguish, embarrassment, or suspicion, saying to himself, if he knew, meaning Jesus, if he knew what kind of person this woman was, he would tell her to stop this behavior in my home. Jesus' conduct didn't meet the rig rigorous religious leader's expectations of Simon. Simon expected Jesus to react to the woman's actions as repulsive, because of her label as a sinner. You know, rabbis never talked with women in public if they could help it. And if they did, they were very, very careful as to how they conducted themselves. It isn't much different than with the Muslim and Taliban society of today. They treat women as second-class citizens. Yet Jesus did nothing to interrupt this woman. He didn't do anything to stop her, and in doing so, was passively approving of her actions. Jesus was breaking every norm in the Jewish religious and moral society. And then Jesus reads Simon's thoughts and tells him a story about forgiveness and gratitude. After getting the reply from Simon that Jesus wanted, Jesus rebukes Simon for his poor hospitality and contrasts her actions toward him. Finally, he declares forgiveness to the woman, which is an act that no one who was attending the dinner can grasp. Jesus says something astounding. Do you see this woman? Simon the Pharisee didn't see her the way that Jesus did. Simon could not see past the label, sinner, loose woman, etc. Simon was practicing a religion of exclusivity. He was in the in crowd. She was in the out crowd. He was one of the saved, she was not. He was one of the holy ones, and she was not. Whenever we use dismissive labels to define people, they blind us to the value of that person, and we miss the opportunity to be channels of God's grace to them. Labels like baby killer, murderer, freak, adulterer, loose woman, predator, etc., these are terms that tend to demonize people. We put labels on people so that we can dismiss them as unworthy of our time, our attention, and our love. The reasons we label others is very simple. It's because it is easier to label them than to love them. It does not recognize the other one as a human being, a brother or a sister in Christ. Labels are tools that we use to devalue people so that we can justify our holier-than-thou attitude. As if we're any better except by the grace of God. Joel Osteen says, people will try to label you not good enough, too slow, too old, too many mistakes. You can't stop negative comments or prevent negative labels, but you can choose not to let them hold you back. Just one or two different decisions in our own lives might have led us to be just like one of them. However, Jesus saw past the labels that people were stuck with. We don't know for certain, but Jesus may have encountered this woman before, and now she is showing her love and gratitude for his acceptance and his grace toward her. Jesus saw the value of this woman and all of her brokenness that led her to this horrible place in her life where her daily decisions compounded every error that she had ever, ever made. Jesus sees past the labels and the things that imprison us into these words. No one out, is outside the reach of grace. Let me repeat that. No one is outside the reach of God's grace. And that is what we must learn. Whenever we assign labels to people, we cast them aside but God doesn't. We all use labels. It's almost unavoidable. It is not hard to do. We stick them on jars and manila folders so that we know what is inside. And we also stick labels on people for the very same reason. 
Our labels of lost, sinner, and unchurched are symptoms of an us versus them attitude. So often we say that we hate the sin but love the sinner. But how much do we really love that sinner? Yes, we apply the label saved to ourselves because we are graciously saved and belong to a wonderful Lord and church. But the only difference between us and them is grace, God's amazing grace. Romans 11:6 6 states, and if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Jesus saw this uninvited guest. He loved her and he wanted to protect her and give her a life of wholeness, one that she could be proud of. And he wanted to stop the damage that she was inflicting upon herself. Not only did this woman experience the compassion and comfort of Jesus, she experienced conviction as well. Conviction is the recognition of your own sin. It humbles you and moves you to change. When people first experience conviction or the awareness of their own sin, they have trouble distinguishing conviction from something else, which is condemnation. Conviction is the internalized voice of God affirming our worth, gently calling us to a life better than our own impulses and offering us a chance to change. Condemnation is the internalized voice of others that have called or labeled us broken or worthless. It calls out the labels of our past based on our worst actions and impulses. It's a voice that condemns us to fail over and over again. Conviction is the awareness that offers us a chance to change with God's help. Condemnation is a voice that says or labels you, you will never be good enough, you will never change. One is the voice of God, the other is not. John 3, 17 says, for God did not, in, did, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Romans 8, 1 says, so now there isn't any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're hearing the voice of condemnation, the one that tells you you will never be good enough, you'll never change, never be acceptable to God, then it's time to tell that voice to shut up. Because this voice often masquerades as the voice of God. It's a trick. It drives you further and further from the Father, who offers forgiveness for free when we simply recognize our need for him. But if you're hearing a voice of conviction, the one that gently corrects you, invites you to change, and whispers that there is a path better than the one that you're headed down, then continue to listen up. God doesn't point out sin because he's against you. He is for you and wants to help you. He wants you to change for the better. There is no place for the voice that separates us from him by telling us that we don't deserve his forgiveness and grace, or that we are not capable of being better than we have been in the past. These labels are all lies. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, So then if anyone is in Christ Jesus, that person is part of a new creation. The old things have gone away, and look, new things have arrived. God offers us his grace and his mercy, which is new to us every day. And nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not death, nor life, nor angels, or rulers, nor present things, or future things, not powers, nor height, or depth, or anything else that is created. God calls us to be his own. He has created labels of his own for us. Acts 17, 28 says, In God we live, move, and exist, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And 1 Peter 2, 9 reads, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. Isaiah 62, 2 states, you will be called a new name, which the Lord's own mouth will determine. And Revelation 2, 17 gives us the most hope. It reads, I will also give to each one of them a white stone with a new name written on it, which no one knows except the one who receives it. 
People struggle to break free of their labels all the time. They tend to, to act out. Uh, they change their behavior, their clothing, their hair, their makeup, etc. One day, the goody-goody gr girl in school comes to school with her hair in braids and in nice clothes. The next day, she comes to, to school in goth clothing. Take the child TV stars when they grow up. They want to break free of their child star image or label. They act out in odd behaviors. Some examples are Miley Cyrus with her behavior at the MTV Awards and Justin Bieber. Instead of ignoring the labels and trusting in God's grace to remove the labels from them, they try to break out on their own, something ca sometimes causing them not only harm to their image, but to their body, their soul, their spirit, their family, and their friends. So for those who are struggling with their own identity, and for those who are struggling because they have let the world tag them with a label, you must remember something very important. God's grace is sufficient for you. God's grace defines you. Society labels you like a part on an assembly line, but whatever the label you have been hit with, that is holding you back, you must remember that God's grace allows you to break out and tear those labels down. God's grace defines you. And as God's grace sinks in, earthly labels get chiseled away. Just imagine God sitting up there in heaven with a hammer and a chisel in his hands, and he's very slowly, slowly chipping away at the layers and layers of labels that encase us. Imagine how you will feel when all those label, layers of labels are gone, the freedom that you will feel. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 states, My grace is sufficient for you because power is made perfect in weakness. So as grace infiltrates, criticism disintegrates. You are and you know who you are because those labels don't say who you are. You know who you are. You are who God says you are. You're spiritually alive. You're heavenly position. You're connected to the Father. An honored child. A person who is God's own possession. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Encourage one another and build each other up. It's easy to be critical or spread gossip in order to tear someone down or to label them. Yet God calls us to do the exact opposite. He wants you to build others up, even the people that you don't like. He, he didn't just create the people that you struggle with. He also died for them. So remember, God says we are chosen, loved, pure, free, worthy, strong, victorious, purposed, and we are valuable. Those are just a few of the words that our Heavenly Father speaks over us. We just need to remember who we are in Christ and boldly declare and live in that identity today. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are so good to offer us freedom. Thank you for freedom from the condemning voices and labels of others and even the condemning voice or label that so often sounds within our heads. Thank you for offering us freedom from our past sins and mistakes. If there is anything in our lives that is keeping us from you through the deception of sin, please bring us the gift of conviction and the desire and strength to offer that sin to you for forgiveness, mercy, grace, and change. Let us speak words of compassion and not condemnation over those you love, including ourselves. And loving God, show us the area where we are tempted to point a finger and label others. Give us new eyes to see others the way you see them and to react to their mistakes with your grace and your mercy. When you give us the gift of being convicted for our own sin, help us to look on our own hearts with the same gentleness that Jesus had for the unnamed woman. Teach us not to label ourselves or others. Make us a part of shaping your church as a place of welcome, forgiveness, mercy, grace, and love. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.